All right. Hello, everybody. Um, what I want to do today is talk through some examples and in fact, work through some examples. And in fact, I'll be working through them at the exact same time or sorry, I'll be working through them for the very first time. This is the first time I've worked through these logic cases. Okay. So we're taking the cases from the textbook, the free online textbook that I shared with y'all. It's not a required textbook for the course. I was giving it to y'all to give you a few extra practice problems, maybe an extra resource if you're really gung ho and want to read some of the chapters. And this is purely on logic. This is a logic textbook, but I just wanted to give you some new examples to work on that will be like the uh, problems that you're given on the logic test. If you haven't taken the logic test and you're wanting more practice, this, is, this video is for you. However, here's a proviso. I highly recommend that you go and work these examples. And I've given you those examples uh, in an email. Uh, go work them before you watch this video. This video is basically gonna be giving you the answers. And here's the thing, you're not gonna be getting good practice if you're just watching me work through the examples. It's like watching somebody play through a video game or something like that. You're not really getting as much practice if you're doing that. You're just watching somebody else do it. Um, you may feel like you're understanding the steps and maybe you are, but there's no substitute for getting your hands dirty and getting hands on with the problems. Okay. Please, please, please. If you want to do well on the logic exam, if you haven't taken it and you're looking for more practice, go do these problems. Okay. So go do them on your own, then come watch this video. You might get them wrong, but you're going to get more out of getting them wrong and then watching this video than watching this video and feeling like you just understand it. Uh, Okay, so in case you're confused, go back, look at the email I sent out. The book is called For All X, and the problems are on pages five and six. They come at the end of each chapter. So that's the end of chapter one. Those are gonna be problems that are about finding the conclusion. And then the next set of problems is on pages 16 and 17, and those problems are about determining validity. And those are both, uh, if you take those two kinds of problems, that's the vast majority, or that's pretty much all of the, the logic exam. You'll have problems just like that. Um, there's a few at the end where you have to explain yourself a little in a way that we won't hear, but that's pretty much it. Okay. So uh, I'll rely on y'all to have that textbook. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna um, just work these in a Word document, share my screen. Now, I've been informed that some of my Word documents on the YouTube videos are fuzzy because the screen sharing, I guess, isn't working too well. Um, so what I'm also gonna do is share with you that Word document. I'm just gonna send it out to y'all so that if it's fuzzy on this screen and you can't see it well, you'll have that Word document that I'm looking at. You can also look at the actual textbook, the For All X, the logic textbook I sent out and see the very same problems. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna pull up that Word document. Okay, so first we have these four problems. This is from the end of chapter one. And our job is to find the conclusion. Now, once you find the conclusion, you know what the premises are because all the other stuff are premises unless they're irrelevant entirely to the argument, but I don't think they've given us any like that. Okay, so we need to find the conclusion. Okay, this is really not a technical process, all right? So it's probably best if y'all think about this as like, don't try to think of me introducing terms that you've never heard before, uh, doing this thing that you've never done before. We all do this all the time. And what logic is trying to do is help us kind of make sense of what we're doing all the time and do it better. And what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what someone is, what a, a, a line of reasoning is trying to convince us of. If I'm trying to convince you of something, uh, there's the conclusion is the thing I'm trying to convince you of. And I'm offering support for that conclusion. And we're just calling that the premises. So you could think about this as the reasons that you should think something or do something. And then the thing that you should think or do, which is the conclusion, the reasons are the premises, the thing that I'm trying to convince you of or convince you to do is the conclusion. Okay, so let's just look at the first one. It's sunny. So I should take my sunglasses. Again, I haven't seen these before. I'm just looking at this. Um, I'm looking at this. How do I figure out what the conclusion is? Well, there's some context clues. Grammatical context clues Those are not foolproof, but in this case, I do have one. And it's the word so. So is a grammatical indicator that what comes after follows from what comes before. So it is sunny comes before. So I should take my sunglasses. That tells me 
uh, I should take my sunglasses because it is sunny. I'm trying to, uh, trying to argue that I should take my sunglasses on the basis that it's sunny. Why should you take your sunglasses? It's sunny. Uh, I should take my sunglasses is the conclusion. That's what I'm trying to argue for in this argument. In this case, I seem to be talking to myself, uh, which I guess we all do. But when you do this, you're thinking, what's the reason that you should take your sunglasses? Well, it's obviously, it's sunny. That's the reason you should take your sunglasses. So that's the one premise in this argument. And so uh, I should take my sunglasses is the conclusion. That seems pretty simple. Let's look at the second one. It must have been sunny. I did wear my sunglasses after all. So we don't have a so or a therefore or a because here. Um, after all is a little bit of an indicator, a grammatical indicator. Um, we don't normally use this. I mean, I don't say after all, all that much, um, but it's an indicator that um, the second thing is the reason for the first thing. Now, okay, this might be a case where y'all don't understand what after all is doing. It's kind of like a, a, an older phrase, um, but just think about, just take it out altogether. If you want to delete this altogether, we can still figure out what the premise and the conclusion are, right? Because what supports what? What could possibly be a reason for what? Is it the case that it being sunny uh, is a reason to where, oh, this is actually a difficult one, actually, uh, especially without the after all. So it being sunny could be a reason to wear sunglasses. But wearing sunglasses actually could be a reason to think that it's sunny too. Like if you see someone wearing sunglasses, right? Um, you have a good reason to think that it's sunny outside, right? If somebody walks into your house from outside and they're wearing sunglasses, what are you gonna conclude? You're probably gonna conclude it's sunny outside. Maybe, I guess you, uh, that's not a foolproof in, uh, inference because they could be blind. Uh, it could be they have really sensitive eyes. Maybe they went to the eye doctor. There's lots of reasons they could be wearing sunglasses, but you're probably going to conclude the most likely reason that someone be, would be wearing sunglasses is that it's sunny outside. So this is a weird one in that um, without any grammatical indicators, it could go any, either way. So that's probably why they included this after all this grammatical indicator. And what this tells us is this person, whoever is making this inference, uh, is saying, I'm concluding that it's sunny because I wore my sunglasses, which is a weird, this is, this could, this one, if you're having trouble with this one, um, the conclusion is actually the first sentence. If you had trouble with that, I understand why you'd have trouble with that. Don't start to doubt yourself. That's a weird inference to make about yourself. It's not a weird inference to make about someone else. If you see someone with sunglasses come into your house, you might conclude that it's sunny on the basis that they're wearing sunglasses. But about yourself, this implies that you have forgotten whether it was sunny or not. Like you're like in the past, you put on sunglasses because it was sunny and then you like got hit in the head or something and woke up and saw that you were wearing sunglasses and concluded that it was sunny. That's weird, it's strange, this is a strange one. Uh, but it must have been sunny. I did wear my sunglasses after all is saying, I'm concluding it's sunny because I wore my sunglasses. Um, if it said it's sunny, I should wear my sunglasses, you'd be concluding the second thing on the basis of the first thing. Okay, let's leave that one aside. That one's weird. Let's look at number three. No one but you has had their hands in the cookie jar and the scene of the crime is littered with cookie crumbs. You're the culprit. I feel like this is a better one, a more straightforward one without weird memory loss stuff implied. Okay, let's read it again. No one but you has had their hands in the cookie jar and the scene of the crime is littered with cookie crumbs. You're the culprit. There are no grammatical indicators, no indicator words like so or therefore or because in this. And yet, this is a really good case. And yet, it's very clear what the conclusion is once you understand the content of what's being said. Here's a question. If you get mixed up, could it be that the claim that you're the culprit 
is actually a reason to think you've had your hands in the cookie jar? Does that support the claim that you've had your hands in the cookie jar? Not really. Um, that's sort of like backwards reasoning. Because it, could it be the claim case that, could it be that you're the culprit supports the claim that the scene of the crime is littered with cookie crumbs? That one's even more clear. No, definitely not. Like if I can't reason from you're the culprit to there are cookie crime, cookie crumbs around here. That doesn't make any sense. But if you flip it, the, there are cookie crumbs around here and I'm gonna conclude on that basis that you're the culprit, that inference actually makes sense. It makes sense how you're, me, I could conclude that you're the culprit on the basis of these other two things, that you've had your hands in the cookie jar and you're the only one that's had your hand is, hands in the cookie jar and the scene of the crime is littered with cookie crumbs. So we don't have any indicator words. There's no like little foolproof, like looking for so's or because or therefores uh, that we could conclude that this is the conclusion. But if you, if you know how to reason, if you kind of like reflect on what's actually being said, if you heard someone say this and you ask, what are they trying to say? Like, what are they trying to imply? Like what, if, if, like imagine someone saying this to you, what are they doing? Well, they're accusing you of being the culprit and they're using these other two claims about the hands in the cookie jar and the scene of the crime being littered with cookie, cookie crumbs as evidence that you're the, you're the culprit. So that says those two things are the premise, premises and you're the culprit is the conclusion. Okay, number four. See, I hope y'all are kind of getting the hang of this. It's again, it's like super intuitive. You do this all the time. You've probably done it four times today. You're using some pieces of evidence or reasons to support another claim. And that claim is just the conclusion. So you just have to ask yourself in these cases, which thing is being supported by the other things? Okay, let's look at the last one. Miss Scarlett and Professor Plum, if you don't know, let me pause for a second. If you don't know, these are, this is a reference to the game Clue, okay? Uh, maybe that's before your time. It's a, probably even a little bit before my time. Miss Scarlett and Professor Plum were in the study at the time of the murder. Reverend Green had the candlestick in the ballroom, and we know that there is no blood on his hands. Hence, Colonel Mustard did it in the kitchen with the lead pipe, did it being... Uh, I guess committed the murder because they're talking about a murder in the first sentence. Recall after all that the gun had not been fired. All right, let's read it one more time because I had like three different sidetracks in there. Miss Scarlett and Professor Plum were in the study at the time of the murder. Reverend Green had the candlestick in the ballroom and we know that there's no blood on his hands. Hence Colonel Mustard did it in the kitchen with the lead pipe. Recall after all that the gun had not been fired. Now here's the thing there's some complicated reasoning going on here and you're missing the context. If you imagine someone saying this, what gun are we talking about here? Like we're missing tons of information and it could get confusing, right? Don't expect, you don't have to understand everything about the context to understand what's, which claim is being argued for here, okay? We don't know anything about the study. We don't know anything about what murder occurred. Who, who got murdered? We don't know. I mean, it could have been Miss Scarlett or Professor Plum because if they're in the study at the time of the murder, maybe they got murdered. Um, we don't know where the murder occurred. Was it in the study? It seems to be implied that it wasn't in the study because it looks like the first claim is being used as evidence that they did not commit the murder if they were in the study. Reverend Green had the candlestick in the ballroom and we know that there is no blood on his hands. Hence, Colonel Mustard did it in the kitchen with the lead pipe. Okay, so what's being argued here is that, uh, well, first of all, you've got an indicator word, hence. I don't know if y'all use the word hence a lot, but uh, it means therefore or so um, or in conclusion. And so the conclusion is actually this claim right here, hence Colonel Muster did it in the kitchen with the lead pipe. Okay, recall after all that the gun had not been fired. We don't know what gun is being talked about here, who had the gun, why that's relevant. We have no idea why that's relevant. I have no idea why you would say the gun had not been fired as evidence that Colonel Mustard did it in the kitchen with the lead pipe. Maybe you're trying to argue that he did it, that he didn't do it with the gun. It hadn't been fired, so it must have been the lead pipe that he committed the murder with. Um, but my point here is 
you don't have to understand everything about the context to understand what's being argued for. You could come in in the middle of this conversation and see, oh, I have no idea what gun we're talking about, whose gun it was, where the study is in relation to the kitchen, who Reverend Green is, who Professor Plum is, who Miss Scarlet is, who Colonel Mustard is, uh, how big is this lead pipe, where is the kitchen, who got murdered, we still don't know who got murdered. Uh, we don't know any of this, but you can still conclude that uh, what this person, whoever's talking, is arguing for is that Colonel Mustard did it in the kitchen with the lead pipe. That's what we're arguing for, or whoever this is, is arguing for. How do you know that? Well, first big thing is the hints, but also um, seems like you can know from this, just reading the context, what context we have is that we're talking about a murder that happened. And what do we want to know in this case? Well, it just seems like what we're trying to figure out is who committed the murder, right? And once you read that whole excerpt, you see that the first sentence is trying to, is probably trying to uh, establish that Ms. Scarlett and Professor Plum could not have committed the murder. Um, the second sentence, because they were in the study and it was committed in the kitchen. Reverend Green had the candlestick in the ballroom and we know that there's no blood on his hands. Again, trying to establish that Reverend Green did not commit the murder either. There's no blood on his hands, right? And again, that's maybe not foolproof, but it's evidence. You see that they're offering evidence. It might be in a courtroom, and you can imagine this happening in a courtroom or something. They're offering evidence that he did not commit the murder. He had no blood on his hands. Colonel Mustard did it in the kitchen with the lead pipe. That's the conclusion. Recall, after all, that the gun had not been fired. And again, like I said, my best guess is what's being argued here is that he didn't do it with the gun because the gun had not been fired. Okay, so you do have to have some context a lot of times to figure out uh, or what's being argued for here, but you often, very often, don't have to have all or even close to all of the context. So here, the conclusion is Colonel Mustard did it in the kitchen with the lead pipe. Everything else is being marshaled as evidence for that conclusion. Okay, hopefully that clarified some things. Again, if you got tripped up on the second one uh, and only the second one, I wouldn't take that as evidence that you're not understanding what's going on. That one was weird. Um, if you got that one, great. I think, you know, if you got all four of them, I think you're, you're really tracking here. Um, if you didn't follow along with any of that, if you didn't get any of these right, we may need to, we may need to talk. Um, Okay, let's move on to this second set. We've got six and uh, six new problems of another, another type, which is uh, we're trying to figure out whether these arguments are valid. Let's review. Valid means the conclusion follows from the premises, which means, in other words, if the premise, assuming the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. And a good test for this is can you, um, can, is it possible? Is there any possibility of the premises being true and the conclusion false? And if there is, then if you can imagine a possibility, it doesn't have to be real. It doesn't have to be even plausible or really uh, realistic. Uh, if you can imagine that possibility, then it's not a valid argument because it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Okay, Socrates is a man. All men are carrots. Therefore, uh, Socrates is a carrot. This little three dot, Triangle is, we're not using that, but in this textbook, they mean, that just means therefore. You could take every one of these and turn it into a therefore um, if you wanted. Okay, is this a valid argument? Answer, yes. Why? Uh, because if Socrates is a man and all men are carrots, there's no way for Socrates to not be a carrot. Now, they're trying to show you with this problem, it's not a trick question, what they're trying to do is teach you something, which is, Arguments with outlandish, stupid, false premises can still be valid because what validity is doing is asking if the premises were true, could the conclusion be false? So if these two premises were true, even though they're false, but if they were true, could the conclusion be false? And the answer is no, so it's valid. Because if Socrates is a man and every single man, that, that is including Socrates, is a carrot, then Socrates has to be a carrot. Okay, so it's a stupid example, but they're trying to use that stupidity to show you something about validity. All right, next. Abe Lincoln was either born in Illinois or he was once president. Abe Lincoln was never president. Therefore, Abe Lincoln was born in Illinois. Is it valid? 
Answer, yes. Again, premise two is false. We know that Abe Lincoln was president. But again, they're trying to show you validity uh, is not directly tied to the truth of the premises. You can have false premises and a valid argument, right? And this one is valid because if you know that either A or B is true, and you know that B is false, then you know that A is true, right? If I tell you, look, it's either gonna be rainy or sunny today, it's not gonna rain today, you know it's gonna be sunny. Similarly, if you know that either Abe Lincoln was born in Illinois or he was once president and he was never president, then you know he was born in Illinois. There's no chance that those first two things could be true and the second thing and the third thing false. All right, if I pull the trigger, Abe Lincoln will die. I do not pull the trigger, therefore Abe Lincoln will not die. Now they're getting, this is a tricky one. It's not a trick question, uh, but it's a little harder. Okay, if I pull the trigger, Abe Lincoln will die. I do not pull the trigger, therefore Abe Lincoln will not die. Okay, think about this one. Think about it. The answer is that this is invalid, right? Now here's why. Just because I know that if I pull the trigger, Abe Lincoln will die, I don't therefore know that there's no other way that Abe Lincoln will die. Think about that, okay? So it might be, imagine this scenario. Here's how you construct a really good counterexample. This is invalid, so I should be able to construct a scenario in which the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. Let me do that for you. Here's a scenario. Um, it's true that if I pull the trigger, Abe Lincoln will die because I've got a gun to his head, a loaded gun that's, that's functional, et cetera, et cetera. So if I pull this trigger, he's going to die. But imagine that two other guys also have guns to Abe Lincoln's head. And if I don't pull the trigger, they're still going to pull their triggers. We are just, you know, we're assassins that really want, we're kind of overkill assassins, pun intended. Uh, we just really want to make sure that the job gets done. I'm sorry, this is turning morbid all of a sudden. But if you got three people there, they're all going to take their shots at the same time because they really want to make sure it gets done. And I know that if it, it's true that the other two guys are going to pull the trigger and fire their shots, their uh, kill shots, uh, regardless of whether I do, um, and let's say I don't pull the trigger, A. Lincoln's still going to die, right? So that's a situation in which uh, I know that if I were to pull the trigger, Abe Lincoln would die. And I'm not pulling the trigger, but Abe Lincoln's still gonna die. So there's, there's in other words, there's cases of overdetermination, like multiple things were going to cause Abe Lincoln's death. So if one of them didn't happen, he's still gonna die. And th that's the situation I'm describing. Um, I mean, you could construct, if, you were, if I asked you to construct a counterexample to show that this argument is invalid, it wouldn't have to be that one. There are lots of them. It might be that I'm the only assassin with a gun to his head, but he's also fixing to have a heart attack, right? So it's true that if I pull the trigger, he'll die, but, and maybe I don't pull the trigger, but it, we can't conclude from that that he's not gonna die, right? Because in this scenario, uh, he's gonna die either way. He's gonna have a heart attack seconds after I was gonna shoot him. Okay, so uh, if you want to go a little deeper here, this is a, 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 a logical fallacy called affirming the consequence, or sorry, affirming the consequent. I talked about that in another video. Uh, if A, then B, B, therefore A, is an invalid argument form. No matter what you put in for A and B there, it's invalid. And it's tricky because it's very similar. If you thought this was valid, probably what you were trying to, probably what you were thinking of it is as is if A then B, A therefore B, right? Similar, but that one's valid, right? If A then B, A therefore B is valid. If A then B, B therefore A is invalid, no matter what you put in for A and B. Okay, let's move on. Don't want to spend too much time on this. Abe Lincoln was either from France or from Luxembourg. Abe Lincoln was not from Luxembourg. Therefore, Abe Lincoln was from France. Valid. Uh, it should look familiar in form to the second one we looked at. Either A or B, not B, therefore A. Either A or B, not B, therefore A. 
uh, again, we won't go through all that again. It's the exact same form. If you know that one of two things are, is true and you know one of them is false, then you know the other one is true. If the world ends today, then I will not need to get up tomorrow morning. I will not need to get up tomorrow morning. Therefore, the world will not end today. Okay, now your head's gonna spin a little bit. This one is valid. It's very similar to affirming the consequent. If you want to take a minute now and try to see if you can figure out how it's different from affirming the consequent. And I'll let you pause this video if you want to do that. But now I'm going to explain. Here is affirming the consequent. Here is what this argument looks like in type putting it into its form. Okay, so you're denying the consequent and concluding the denial of the antecedent. And again, just to refresh you, the consequent is the thing in an if then claim that comes after the then. The antecedent is what comes between the if and the then. If that jargon helps you use it, if it doesn't, forget about it. Um, but here we're saying, if the world ends today, then I, I don't need to get up tomorrow morning, but I am gonna need to get up tomorrow morning, so the world will not end today. Okay, so uh, let me, maybe what'll help most here is seeing or hearing a few different arguments that take up this same form. Um, maybe some, hopefully some are more intuitive than this one. Um, I might say, uh, sorry, uh, imagine that you and I are having a, an argument. We're in a closed room. Let's say we're in my office at TCC. And I say that because my office at TCC has no windows. And even if you open the door, you can't see to the outside. You see into a dark hallway. Um, so when you're in that office, you're like in a little time warp where you can't see what's happening outside. So we're in that office and imagine um, we're having an argument about whether it's raining or not. And I say, maybe I think it is raining and you think it's not. And you might tell me like, Justin, if it were raining right now, you'd hear it on the roof. But look, you don't hear it on the roof, so it's not raining. Does that argument make sense? I, I hope it does. Um, that's the exact same kind of argument here. You're saying, if this were true, then this other thing would be true. But that's not, that second thing is not true. So the first thing is not true. If, let's, let me give you one more example if I can think of one. Um, let's see. Maybe we're having another argument about whether my class is too hard. Um, some of y'all might have strong opinions about this. I hope, I hope not. Um, but if we're having that argument and uh, I'm like, look, you now like consider my argument. I might be saying, you might say, look, the class is too hard, the class is too hard, the class is too hard. And I might say, look, the class is not too hard, right? If the class were too hard, then I'd have, you know, at least 10% of my students failing. But I don't have 10% of my students failing, so it's not too hard. Does that argument make sense? It seems like a good argument, right? Even if the claims are not true, it might still be a good argument in the sense that the conclusion follows from that claims, from those claims, and it does. It's if you think that it, if you accept the claim that it's not, if it's too hard, more than 10% of people would be failing and you accept the claim that under 10% of people are failing, then you have to conclude that it's not too hard. And then what you're going to start doing is arguing with one of those two claims. If you still disagree with my conclusion, you might say, no, 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 a class can be too hard, even though less than 10% of people are failing. Or you might say, no, 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 you're wrong. Actually, more than 10% of people are failing. So there you're questioning one of those two premises. But the argument is valid in that if those two premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. Okay, so we'll move on from that one. That one, that fifth, this fifth thing right here was a valid argument. This is a weird one. I don't know why they did this one. Joe, Joe is now 19 years old. Joe is now 87 years old. Therefore, Bob is now 20 years old. I think what they're throwing this in here is like, this is an invalid argument. Um, it, the claims just have no relation to each other. How could you conclude that Bob is 20 just on the basis that Joe is 19 and Joe is 87? 
right? Um, I don't know. So uh, construct a counter example. What they might be doing here is something really tricky, which we won't talk about, which is that if two premises are, are uh, if you, they can't both be true at the same time, which these apparently can't both be true at the same time, then technically you don't, please just don't worry about this. Technically it's a valid argument if that's true, because um, the definition of validity is it's impossible for the premises to be true, for all premises to be true and the conclusion false. And in this case, it's just impossible for all premises to be true. So therefore it's impossible for all premises to be true and the conclusion false. Okay, and if that made sense, it's a sort of like a little loophole in the definition of validity. So this technically would be valid. I think this is like, we're talking about like super upper division class, logic class stuff here. Um, I think maybe the right thing to do, if, the, if I were to put this on a test, I would actually count either answer correct. Um, because technically it's valid. But if someone were to say it's invalid because, uh, you know, imagine that Joe is 19 and another Joe is 87. Uh, you could still imagine Bob being 21. There's no relation between Joe being a certain age and Bob being a certain age, unless you put that in there explicitly. Okay, so I'll say this. Um, I think let's just forget about this one. Um, if you said it was invalid and you said something like I just said, there's no relationship, you know, there's no reason to think that just because Joe is a certain age, Bob has to be a certain age, or at least the argument hasn't given us any such reason. Um, good, you're on the right track, don't worry. If you happen to have so much technical, logical knowledge that you were able to give the explanation of why this could be seen as technically valid, wow, why are you in this class? Uh, you're like, at a graduate level or something. But, um, so I wouldn't worry about this one. Let me give you a similar one just so you don't miss out on a sixth example. We could see a valid argument. Let's, let's try taking an invalid one and turning it into a valid one. So imagine I said, Joe is 19 years old now. And then therefore Bob is 27 years old now. This is invalid as it stands because there's no um, there's no relationship between Joe or no stated relationship between Joe's and Bob's age. As far as this argument goes, assume that Bob is not Joe is 19. Well, uh, counterexample: Bob is only three years older than Bob, so uh, Bob is only three years older than Joe, so Bob is 22 years old now. But suppose, so that's an invalid argument. You can easily construct a counterexample um, where Bob is just three or four or five years older than Joe or 20 years older than Joe or whatever. But if the argument was this, it would be valid. Uh, Bob is always eight years older than Joe at any given time. Now it's a valid argument because you can't imagine those premises being true and the conclusion is false assuming that the Bob is the same Bob across the premises and the conclusion. And Joe is the same Joe across both premises. If Joe is 19, Bob is always eight years older than Joe, then Bob has to be 27. Okay, so that's just to give you a valid form or a valid version of that. Right? Actually to change, so you pull the second premise out and it becomes invalid again. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Um, this is already a pretty long video, but if, uh, if you worked through those ahead of time uh, and you got mostly the right answers, then I'd say you're in pretty good shape for the logic test. Uh, if you understood why you got the wrong ones wrong, you're in even better shape. Um, if you got most of them wrong, then I invite you, if you're, and you're confused about some of the explanations, hit me up, send me an email, we'll talk. And other than that, uh, I will see y'all later.